Hey everybody, it's Zach Call. I'm back with another video. It has been a long time. Uh, don't think I've done one in 2020 yet, so it's probably been maybe two months since my last video. Um, but I thought today, uh, Fate Condensed just came out from Evil Hat uh, maybe a week ago, and I'm super excited about it. You might have seen previous uh, video that I did covering the Fate Space Toolkit, which I am super excited about. Um, I've kind of talked about that a little bit. I have, if you follow my socials, you know that I'm just a huge fan of the fate system, both core, which is what I'm most experienced with and accelerated. Um, they're just great systems for my style of gameplay, which is basically, I want to play in my favorite TV show or my favorite movie or my favorite comic book or my favorite book series. Um, being able to continue to tell stories past the like official canon. So um, fate is just a super quick and easy way of doing that. And what they've done, which I think is super smart of evil hat, what they've done is they've taken the 300 page book or so I actually have the book, the, the actual core book right here. Hang on. They've taken this full fate core book which was published i think it's been maybe at least 10 years now um but it's almost a 300 page book um let me double check when it was published uh 13 so it's been over it's been about seven years now since fate core was first since face core was first published um and they have taken that 300 page book and they've condensed it down to just a 50 page document um, and a little bit of update, uh, a little bit of updating to the rules. Nothing huge like fate core is still fate core. Um, and fate condensed is basically like a, um, I don't know, maybe like a, if fate core is version 1.0, um, which is not, it's more like version 4.0 of the fate system. But if it's, you know, 4.0 fake condensed might be 4.1. I think it's a great entry point for folks who, um, maybe you're an experienced game master and you don't need a ton of examples and introduction to what role-playing games are, um, et cetera, et cetera. You just want to be able to see exactly how the system functions. Fate condensed is perfect for you. Um, it is currently up on the PDF is currently up on both evil hats, itch store and, uh, on drive through RPG. Um, but I just wanted to do a quick video of basically my first look. I've not looked at this document. Um, I'm obviously, I am familiar with fake core, uh, love running it, but thought this would be a cool, uh, cool video to kind of look through, tell you all about it. If you haven't known about it. So fate condensed is still part of fate's licensing. So fate runs in the similar way of like power by the apocalypse uh, runs that if you want to run a game, um, they have all of almost all of their game rules is up on the fate SRD that you can use um, in your own game. If you're running something, um, I believe fate condensed was part of a, the, the Kickstarter for Fate of Cthulhu. Um, and so, uh, yeah, very excited. So look at this, F the technically, okay, so 52 pages, um, but really 50 pages since introduction starts at page three and the last page seems to be 52. So all of this system is being thrown into 50 pages, which I just think is great. So, um, in as compact form as well, I can manage. I think that's right. I don't think there's any other things considering that they have cut a 300 page book down into 50 pages. Um, you could easily take fate condensed and depending on what you're running, if you were, for instance, what I really want to run is a expanse game, uh, based on the book and television series, the expanse and use fate to, to run it. Um, can easily do that with the 50 page fake condensed book. And then they may be like 50 pages that I really need from fate space toolkit. Um, 
it's just a great, great system. So, uh, same things that we always need to run fate. You're going to need some dice, um, some tokens to represent fate points. Um, and, uh, I prefer to use like something like index cards, uh, if you have them lying around or if you're willing to invest getting some small, uh, dry or wet erase cards that are similar size, but reusable instead of kind of throwawayable bare minimum, some sticky notes, um, to, to write things like situational aspects on. Then we got fate dice, which are really, really cool. I wish there was more in this kind of renaissance of rpg games and all the incredible artisan dice that's out there i hate that fate dice get kind of and fudge dice get left by the wayside of that it's so hard to find cool colorful exciting fate dice it's all just your standard you know seven core dice your d20s your d6s blah 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 but you can run it i have run fate with just normal d6s um, so you can do that too. I've not played a game yet with fate of the deck of fate, which is super cool. It's just a card deck with the same amount of randomness and you just draw a card instead of rolling the dice. Um, which honestly, like I think could be really fun, especially on the go. I mean, you could take this, you know, I, I think they're looking at doing print on demand for this. Um, I, I mean, I would not blame evil hat at all if they decided not to you know, print this. It's a 50 page document that, you know, I don't know if it would make business sense to really print 500 of them or a thousand of them or whatever unit makes the most sense. So you're probably not going to find fake condensed at your favorite local game store. Uh, but pod would be great. I would absolutely buy it, um, on demand because I could take fake condensed and the deck of fate basically with me and run any fake game that I wanted. Um, yeah, it'd be great. So let's check out the changes from fake core. Um, kind of an explanation of what I've already said, 300 pages down to 50. Uh, one point stress boxes to help reduce confusion, which I think makes sense. Um, Balsera style initiative or elective action order. Uh, that was a variant or an optional rule in fake core. And it's just the default now. Um, which I think makes sense. Uh, I see other game systems do this really well. Uh, I think the one I have seen it the most useful and do the most is with um, Star Trek Adventures. They do kind of popcorn initiative. Just players choose who they want to who wants to go first, and then you swap over to the adversaries. Um, so super cool. Uh, but that's now the default. Uh, so they've made some changes to advancement by eliminating significant milestones and finessing major to compensate. I think that probably will make sense. We'll, I'll take a look at that on page 39 here in a little bit, but, um, I have found that fate games are generally one shots or short games. Like you're not going to see a, like, because it's not a leveled style game like a pathfinder or a D D et cetera. Um, there's not a determined like tree that you're really chasing. Um, the games end up being a little more, uh, on the shorter side, um, because you don't have it in your idea, like this idea of, you know, taking something all the way to 20, uh, level 20 or whatever the end level might be. Um, removed the notion of active of active opposition as separate from the defend action remove the notion of active opposition so, oh, okay so yeah so in fake core there used to actually be this active opposition that wasn't the same thing as using the defend action which does kind of muddy the waters but like what am i actually supposed to use defend for so they've taken that out and then there's some effects about that for a tie result so that's cool um they now actually bring up full defense um and it looks like defend action has had an ex expanded scope which is good because i think it needed to kind of see a little bit more to make it useful um, and then they are presenting some additional rules from DFA and 
fate adversary, which is super cool because, you know, the one, if you kind of have a hitch about fate, it's that while everything is so darn cheap for what the amazing game system you're getting is that some rules do get spread out over different systems. So like if you want to run a full, like a magic system that, you want to bring a certain level of like crunchiness to you should probably go find the rules from Dresden files and get it. Um, and then they've got all the toolkits, which are amazing if you run a lot of fate games, but it does mean collecting a couple different PDFs. So I like a lot that they have pulled in a couple different rule sets that have found themselves popular with the community and they're just putting it here in fate condensed instead of leaving it up to those other books so we've got uh our getting started uh i re first off i really like i mean so no art which you know what you're getting i think if you if you pay or are getting fate condensed um you know that it's cut out as much fluff as possible. And I, while I think art is great, I love looking at art and it does kind of can bring you into a world and give you an idea of what a world is supposed to look like. It does become trying as a GM who's just trying to read through a PDF, potentially even on my phone or on my tablet of like scrolling past full page art to try to get to the rule set that I need. So I really actually like that there is a just very printer friendly, no art, just bare bones available rule set that I can just get. And I wish more folks would do that, even if it was an included price and included cost to the normal rule set of like, oh, also here's our kind of like condensed version of the Pathfinder rules, which would obviously be like still huge, kind of hard to take a 550 page book um narrow that down so we're going to define our setting um we're then going to create our characters and uh, i mean same stuff that fate already has we've got aspects skills stunts stress consequences your refresh and then like your personal details and stuff aspects are what drives fate and so the, the very first thing you're on page four, you're already reading about aspects. Um, I, again, as a GM, a forever GM trademark, um, being able to have a 50 page document that I can send to potential new players. Like if I'm running a new actual play and using fate, instead of sending a 300 page book PDF or otherwise to my players, having this this is just make it so much easier to hand out to players just to immediately know here's what you need to know to be able to run this game. Um, so we've got aspects that are short phrases of who your character is or what's important to them. Um, the first thing to know about them is aspects are true. Um, so in other words, how you define your character is real and true in the story that you are telling. So if you write down that your character is a precog sniper, then they are a precog sniper. You've told everyone that your future sees the future and is a crack shot with a rifle. I love aspects. And honestly, like as a, as I read fiction or as I watch movies, I've even started to think of what would this character's high concept be? Um, high con or what would their other kind of like free aspects of their trouble be so really popular one i've been rereading the dresden files book series it's my favorite of all time and a new book's coming out this year i think it's the book the the series 20th anniversary and so i'm i'm going back through it and obviously fate is an, an evil hat has the dresden files ip for role-playing games and so we have a dresden files role-playing game that has concepts um, but the main character, Harry Dresden, his high concept would be that he is a, you know, wizard detective in Chicago and wizard detective in Chicago. Even if you just said wizard detective, those two words tell you a lot about the world that you're playing in. You're saying that magic is real. My character has the ability to use magic. Um, I am a detective, so I'm really good at investigations, potentially at talking with people, at finding out stuff. Um, being just those two words tell you so much about the character, and it's so important when you are 
creating your fate character. And honestly, like, even as like I read and consume fiction, it just makes a ton of sense that like, even if you're an author or a potential perspire, like, uh, a, uh, you know, but maybe you want to become an author. I feel like fate games and RPG games in general, such a great way of creating your own characters. Um, just get something on paper. So you've got your trouble, something that makes your life a little more complicated and then a relationship with another PC. And I love role-playing games that in character creation, you're creating relationships with your other player characters, your adventuring party, if you will, it makes, session zero and session one goes so much easier when you have pre-established relationships and that there's a history there that a life has been lived and that you have already created relationships with the people that you're adventuring with instead of um your classic trope you meet in a tavern kind of stuff um a couple free aspects uh, and then we have the skills and the skill ladder um I'll be honest, I always just use the the rating instead of the adjectives because I can't keep it straight. But if I was going to create a, I mean, the skill ladder is absolutely the number one thing that would be on a fate GM screen if you were the type to, to run with a screen. Um, so you choose your character skills, one great, two good, three fair, four average, and all others mediocre. Another thing that I love about fate is that you can leave some of your skills empty and decide in game that, Hey, like I left two of my average skills and one of my fair skills empty. And I'm getting into a situation where I'm going to need to, I want to use a skill that I haven't assigned a, a rating yet. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, put, uh, I didn't think that, or I wasn't sure how good my character was at picking locks. Um, but session one i'm in a situation where i need to break into something so i'm going to go ahead and put burglary in my in my plus two skill great i love that flexibility um because yeah you don't always know exactly who your character is going to be when you get into the game so we've got a description of our default skill lists um it's super easy to swap one in and out rename something to make sure that it fits with your setting but overall, I find that they're really great. I will say the one thing that uh, running the game, so many people don't think of, especially if you're running a modern game and it's the first modern setting game that your players have played in, if they're used to like D&D or something, they think of drive as like almost like willpower is like the ability to like push through in a situation. And I was like, no, this is you driving a car. <laughs> Uh, like I can't get it, drive, can't get more literal than that. But if you don't read the description, you're like, oh yeah, I put a ton in drive because I have a, you know, they're really driven to uh, like accomplish something. I was like, nope, that's not, no, I mean, aspect, a great aspect, not this skill. I love that. It's just, I love this plain lookout layout for it. So easy to go. Um, they couldn't squeeze all the skill descriptions into two pages uh, it would be great if you could just lay them out and have them all there like in a book but no problem uh will gets thrown out there at the end um and then alternative skill list so when you're building your own implementation of fate the first thing to think about is whether or not you'll keep the same skill list absolutely a skill list is the game for the most part your ass like as a GM, the first thing that I do when I'm creating a potential new fate game is what is the skill list? What do I need to, is there anything I need to remove? Is there anything that I need to combine? Do I need to separate out anything? Do I need to add something totally new? Um, so for like my expanse game, um, I played with the skills a, a lot. Um, I, I think there's maybe 20 skills in my expanse game. Default has 19 and players rate their characters above the default of zero and 10 of them. So about half you have some kind of rating. And if you change the number of skills, you may want to change how the ratings are allocated. I'd agree with that. If you add more skills, maybe add an additional fair um, or good skill just so that I, I would say it, it's probably good to keep your players at, you know, in 
divided by two or n divided by two minus one skills that they have a rating in. <laughs> Defaults gets focused on answering the questions, what can you do, but you don't have to do that. If you want a list focused on what do you believe or the question, how do you do things, which is basically how fate accelerated does um, job roles and a crew and so on. I mean, that would get really creative. I have never like, uh, I have not besides approaches, which is a, the fate accelerated replacement of skills, which is basically you have six approaches to things. And like for one of them, I think is, uh, is, Oh shoot. I can't remember what it was like sneaky. Maybe let's just say it's sneaky. One of the approaches, no matter what you're doing, if you're doing it in a sneaky way, you would roll with your sneaky rating, um, which is great for on the fly, quick games. Fate accelerated is a great way to do, uh, for instance, in, in my brain, a Harry Potter game because the magic system is not set. There's no, not a lot of rules that JK Rowling created for her magic in Harry Potter. It's really about like, what are you trying to like, how are you trying to accomplish this thing? So fate accelerated is great for that. Um, then skill ratings in fate are structured to support character niches. That's why in the default players start with a pyramid shape. I really do like the skill pyramid of basically like you have your one starting at great. And then you have a couple more that are good. You have a couple more that are fair. Um, it's just good for, for balance. We actually do have a, um, example here, which is great. So it's not like they've cut out all examples. They have just restricted this, how to sum up skills and assigning your own skills. They've got it down to just a couple sentences. Mm. Excuse me. Just a couple sentences, which is awesome. We got refresh, which is the minimum number of fate points that you start with. You start with three. Um, you can also, uh, depending on what kind of rule set you're using, you can have more or less fate, uh, more refresh. Um, to, so like you could do a trade off of like adding a new stunt in exchange for having a, a refresh and then stunts are the, what I have found the best way to explain stunt is that the game has rules. And then stunts allow you to bend the rules in your character's favor. So probably the, the number one way that I've seen a stunt used is um, you can uh, give yourself a bonus for like a really specific instance or to let you in a very specific instance, let you use a skill that you otherwise couldn't use. So um, a stunt would potentially let you roll burglary for a social situation. Um, I can't think of a really great example for that right now, but like using a, a skill in place of another skill that other characters couldn't do to let you kind of do the thing that you're really good at as much as possible. Um, that's kind of what I've seen stunts be the most helpful with. Um, some great stuff for, oh, and here's basically what I just said. You've got example bonus grant, you've got bonus granting stunts, and then you've got rule changing stunts with the number one being swapping skills used in a given situation. Um, oh yeah. So like using stealth to backstab somebody instead of using the fight skill. That's absolutely like, a, that is a, like almost a given stunt, depending on what kind of character you're building. Um, Write this type of stunt as follows. Because I blah, 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 I can blah, but only blah. Yep, it's great. Because I don't believe in magic, I can ignore the effects of a supernatural ability, but only a once per game se session. That would be really cool. I really like that. Uh, because I'm a military trained sniper, I get a plus two when I use shoot to attack a target when I have a target in my sights. And they've used this different font in my sights as a... Uh, to kind of indicate this is a situational aspect. So in this case, I would probably have had this player uh, use a create an advantage 
uh, roll to create an advantage or just narratively they have set up on a roof somewhere and have aimed down the barrel and taken a moment to make sure that they're aimed properly. It's like, cool, now you can use your uh, stunt to get a plus two. Then you got stresses and consequences. So stresses and consequences is basically the health that uh, in, in fate, so no HP, which is great because HP is a very gamified thing that does kind of, I'm not a, I am not a gamer that looks for a lot of vermicillitude in my games for similitude or vermicillitude. I forget the order of the M and the S in that word, but I'm not looking for a ton of realism in my game, but I do like that we have taken, we have stress and consequences to represent the toll that a body can take or even like the luck it could represent the luck that it takes for you to dodge out of the way so that you aren't killed but it does inflict a physical stress so it doesn't always reflect like the fact that you got hit with something it's just how many more of these things can happen before you are taken out or before you're in serious trouble um you have physical and mental stress um, and then consequences are kind of like this additional thing like hey like you just took a huge hit. You can take a consequence um, that lasts a long time, like depending on how bad the consequence was. Was it a mild consequence? Well, that, that might last throughout the rest of the scene and it impacts what your player, your character can do and what other characters can do to your PC. Or it could be a severe consequence that ends up lasting multiple game sessions and it takes a long time for you to recover from it. So. Um, big fan of the stress and consequences system. So this is one of the changes that they made it condensed is that fake core used like incrementing. So like one stress and then a box for two stress and then a box for three stress, but it was really hard to communicate that to a player like that. It didn't tick up it's not like you're counting down. It's like, okay, you just got hit for one stress. You mark the first box, but if you hadn't gotten hit with anything and then you get hit with a two stress attack, you don't mark the first and the second box. You just mark the second box because that second box is actually representative of two stress, not the second stress on your stress track. Um, but that's kind of complicated and kind of unnecessary. Um, they have reverted fate condensed. Um, and, and I've, I think I've basically done this in my fate games myself is that like, it basically counts up. You have boxes and each box represents a stress. Um, so yeah. So like in fate condensed, you would mark multiple boxes depending on how much stress you got hit it with fake core and default, you only mark one box for each time you got hit or something happened to you. You would just hit the box that was like more accurate to the situation. Um, so Fade Accelerate actually has a single track for stress. It doesn't separate out physical and mental. Um, I don't particularly care either way. It just depends on what kind of game you're running. Um, yeah, I would say that because of the way the game is kind of run, I would probably almost make default four or five stress. Um, and you definitely might have to play around with that. So we got rolling the die, but, uh, number one rule fiction first. I love, 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 love that in fate it's like the idea isn't to find and this is a difference in you know your stand like your more common D, D pathfinder games is you know i'm gonna look at my character sheet and my character sheet's gonna tell me what i can do and then i'm gonna decide what i can do based on what my character sheet tells me that i like that's a fun game to play i still play that game a ton 
But my favorite way to play is actually being able to tell a story and I decide what my character does without even really having to look at my character sheet. My character sheet doesn't dictate the box that I have to play in. Let the fiction of the story that we're all telling together play out. And then based on what I decide my character should do, then I figure out, okay, what are the mechanics that look like that? And that's a, a that's a team decision made at the table with you, the player, the GM, even involving the other players to see like, does this skill make the most sense? Um, and I love that type of game. I have, I love fiction first fate games. So much fun. Um, so uh, your standard, you know, I'm going to do this. The GM either sets a difficulty level that you need to hit in order to succeed, or you are being actively opposed and someone, uh, you know, the GM or an, I guess I could, could potentially another PC could roll a defend action and you compare the two. Um, and it's great. Um, so, I mean, basically it. Um, so you can invoke aspects to kind of get you, um, you know, addition uh, to what you rolled. You try to invoke a, uh, you can spend a fate point that is kind of like Star Trek uh, Adventures has momentum. The players have momentum and then the GM has threat, but they're essentially the same same thing. Just named different things because of the, the story that Star Trek Adventures is telling. In, in fate, the GM has their own pool of fate points, and then each player has their pool of fate points. Your refresh dictates to you how much fate points you start out a session with. Um, and the the big the thing that makes fate kind of fun and, and the game, like the gamification of fate is this economy around fate points, is deciding, okay, I'm gonna act in this way in this situation in order to try to get as many fate points as possible. I'm going to try to do as well as I can in this situation that might not like, it might be pretty easy, but I'm going to go all out. Um, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do the least amount as possible to reserve my fate points so that I can hang on to them for, because I know I've got that big boss that's coming up. Um, playing with that fate point economy, um, allowing something bad to happen to your character in a moment where maybe it, it doesn't really matter in the long term in order to accrue more fate points so that you can then use them to be a badass and like the next scene or a couple scenes down the line um, is great. So you can spend a fate point to invoke it or free invokes are all over the place. You know, uh, a lot of stunts or your create an advantage action creates aspects that have a free invoke where you don't have to um, spend a fate point to invoke it. And that gives you an automatic plus two to whatever role uh, if you're invoking an aspect. Um, and then we've got the bogus rule. Anybody at the table can say that's bogus to invoking an effect. Simply put, the bogus rule is a calibration tool anyone on the table can use to help the group make sure the game stays true to its vision. Um, Bogus rule is included in their uh, safety tools, which I love that they're including safety tools. Um, and they found like it's a 50 page document that they have created and they is just true to the people that evil hat are that they still found the space and the appropriate amount of effort to put in for um, talking about safety tools, which is great. Um, Oh, so this is a great example of like someone invoking the aspect great at first impressions to throw a car. Yeah, that's likely bogus. Um, but maybe that character has a supernatural stunt that makes them incredibly strong, strong enough to plausibly throw a car. And this is their opening gambit in a fight with a horrible monster. I mean, maybe I would still probably say that that's pretty bogus. Um, great at first impressions. Well, I don't know. Maybe like if they were trying to intimidate 
but again, that's why Fate really is a fiction first game. You have to kind of describe and talk out like not only what your character is doing, but what is their emotional state? What are they trying to accomplish by the, performing the action they're doing? My player says, I would really like to flip this car over using my supernatural strength in order to try to either impress or intimidate the the enemy and really make a big show of my strength. But like, great, then yeah, you are great at first impressions, even if it's a negative or an intimidating impression. Absolutely invoke that aspect. Um, that would be a personal aspect, like an, a character aspect that is on their sheet that does cost a fate point to um, to invoke. So you can either do a plus two bonus to your roll or re-roll all four dice. Um, which is great because you can decide to invoke an aspect after you roll. Love it. Um, you can only invoke the same aspect, um, you, or you can't invoke the same aspect multiple times on the same roll, but you can spend as many free invokes on an aspect as you would like on the same roll. Most often you'll invoke one of your character aspects, but sometimes you'll invoke a situation aspect or even make a hostile invocation of another character's aspect. Yep. So you use stunts. Then you have outcomes, so the difference between the effort, so like your total between any skill bonuses or aspect bonuses and what you rolled on the dice, all that combined is your effort. The difference between your effort and whatever the difficulty was determined to be is measured in shifts. So if you beat the difficulty by one, that's a one shift um, value. Um, and those shifts determine how much stress you might be putting onto excuse me, a character. So if your efforts less than the target difficulty, you fail. <laughs> if your efforts equal to the target, you tie. If your efforts one or two shifts target more than the target, you succeed. And then if your efforts three or more shifts more than the target, you succeed with style. Succeeding with style normally um, might invoke, uh, a f uh, might create a situational aspect that you can then with a free invoke that you or other members of your party might be able to uh invoke later for more bonuses um, um when you fail you might just fail or you might succeed at a pretty major cost or you might take a hit like absorbing stress or using a consequence or something like that um and then when you tie, you can succeed at a minor cost or you can just partially succeed at what you're doing. Um, so uh, this is great. In your success, what, do we, what does it look like to apply fiction first to success? The fiction defines what success looks like. If Ethan didn't have the tools or experience needed to break into the safe, well, then maybe success is more like... Um, if the, like he was able to like pull a couple of pages out of the safe, like in a crack or something um, in it. So if the team, if Ethan was on the team because he built the safe, that success might look like more like with our with style example. Yeah. So like, yeah, again, fiction first, like what if, if you told us what you were attempting to do, hopefully like the best players in fate tell you more than I want to attempt to open the safe. Okay. What are you doing to attempt? Like, what are you doing to open the safe? What are you hoping to achieve by doing this? Blah, blah, blah. And then you can just add more to the story, the fiction of it. Once uh, your, you know, the result has been determined. So there's four actions. You've got overcome, you've got create an advantage, you've got attack and defend. So um, these are kind of like the biggest things um, and again, I don't really mean to make this like a fate core explanation video, but I do find that a lot of folks, you know, they maybe haven't played with fate core before. And so they might not know the system. So hopefully, you know, if you're running across this video because it's talking about fate condensed, which is a fairly new product, but you've never played fate core before. Hopefully this is a cool explanation. Um, the, the overcome is basically being able to, you know, athletics to climb over walls, um, investigate, putting together clues. Um, these are, oh, I, I 
think of overcoming almost like your generic skill check in D and D you're trying to navigate through a forest. You would use your overcome action, um, to, and a certain, whatever skill, whether it's athletics or blah, 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 to kind of get you through the forest. Um, Creating an advantage is honestly like that's the biggest thing that players have a hard time grasping in fate. Um, especially if you're in a like combat or an encounter scenario, um, where creating an advantage is actually the best thing to do in a situation while, but so many characters are just, or so many players are just used to attacking and try attempting to cause damage where, you know, if you can get it, if you can kind of explain to your your team of like we're telling a story and we're just having to use dice to decide if that story works so just because you have a gun doesn't mean you would immediately shoot at a target what if instead you decided to try to shoot out the one light in this warehouse to create an advantage so that it's pitch black but then your werewolf friend who can see in the dark he can then use that situational aspect to create, like give himself a boost on his next thing. Um, so basically you're, you are creating by creating an advantage. You tell a fiction of what you're attempting to do. You use that, whatever skill is the most applicable. And then when you succeed, you create a situational aspect that has one free invoke on it, which means that anybody else, um, on your team, another PC can then use that free invoke on their next action um, to do something even better than they could have if you had just tried to straight up attack someone. Um, if you succeed with style, they, there's two free invokes on it, which is just great. Um, but if you fail, the enemy gets a free invoke on the aspect instead. Um, so maybe you tried to shoot the light out, but you failed. If I was the GM, what I would say is no, you actually succeed at turning out the light, but now it is the enemy's turn. And it turns out they brought their no, like low light vision goggles and can see fine in the dark too. And now they get to inv have a free invoke on that. Just a really fun way of being able to tell a story. Attacks pretty like basic. Um, uh, just, I'll say that the, um, shifts of success determine how much stress has to be used to absorb that attack. Um, and then defending. So I, I am going to look at this, um, as the monster trying to eat your face. So foe pushing you out of the way as you, f as they flee your wrath. What about when the could Cultist tries to stab you. Defend, defend, defend. Defend's the only reaction in Fate Condensed. You use it to stop something from happening outside your turn. Because it's a reaction you almost all you're almost always facing an opposing role rather than a static difficulty. Your enemy makes their role and you immediately roll to defend against it so long as you're the target or you can justify your ability to oppose it. So like if Superman can get in the way of the bullet that's being shot at a uh, innocent bystander, even though he isn't the target of the attack, he can say, well, I am Superman and I have super speed and I could get in the way of it. Cool. Roll defend. So if you fail your defend roll, obviously you take the hit. If you tie, you basically use the, whatever the, uh, the attack action or the create uh, advantage action that is happening on the flip side that tells you what the tie should be. If you succeed, you don't take the hit or you deny the enemy's action. And then if you succeed with style, you don't take the hit. You deny the enemy's action and you even get a boost, which is awesome. A plus one to something that you can then use in the moment. So, um, default list of skills, follow these guidelines, fights and scoot. <laughs> Fight and, scoot. Fight and shoot can be used to make physical attacks. Athletics can be used to defend against any physical attacks. Fight can be used to defend against melee physical attacks. Provoke can be used to make a mental attack. And will can be used to defend against mental attack. And then other skills can 
gain permission to attack or defend under sp special circumstances as determined by the GM or table consensus. Yeah. So we got aspects. Um, big picture about uh, aspects. Obviously, I don't think these have changed at all. You, it, They're talking about compelling uh, aspects, different kinds of aspects, like character aspects, situational aspects, boosts. Um, I will say the ellipsis trick is really great. If you want an easy way to ensure you have room to incorporate aspects into a role, try narrating your action with an ellipsis at the end and then finish the action with the aspect you want to invoke like this. Ryan says, I'm trying to decipher the runes and dot, dot, dot rolls the dice, hates the result. And if I haven't been there, I've read about it. So he spends a fate point, invokes his character aspect saying, well, I've read about these runes and so i'm going to invoke that to re-roll and he gets a better result so i easily start rambling about their origin actually my favorite way to spend fate points is invoking to declare story details spending a fate point to add an important or unlikely detail to the story based on an aspect in play um based on an aspect in play is really important there if you go back and watch my fate superhero game that i ran on encounter rp's twitch and youtube channel um it's called young heroes of fate uh it was my first time running a fake core game and i allowed a lot of spending fate points to invoke story details that weren't necessarily like because we were playing virtually we didn't have a ton a ton of situational aspects um there were definitely moments where if I was at a table and I was way more strict on like what situational aspects are there actually in this moment and what do your characters know about, um, really what ended up happening was, you know, a, a character creating you spending a fate point to introduce something new into the fiction to make things crappy like have a lot of fun with the situation ended up for a great story ended up for a great show and an actual play i think um not a great example of how to actually uh use that rule capels are great and a huge part of the fate core uh, or the fate point economy of being okay with accepting an a complication that the GM or another player offers you so that you can accrue more fate points so that you can then spend them on other things. Um, creating aspects, I, man, I just really love, I love the topography. I love the, the simple layout. Like this is just perfect for what this is. And honestly, like I'll just say it again. I wish more publishers created more condensed versions of their rule set like this. Um, it's kind of talks about the different kinds of scenes we they fake horror or fate uses a zone uh way of laying out so instead of playing on like a five by five or an inch by inch grid that represents five feet and you only have, can move a certain amount of feet per round or whatever they just split it up they split the map up into zones i'm normally split as any scene up in maybe three or four zones and you can move one zone per round unless you have a stunt that allows you to move multiple zones in a single turn um it's great turn order so this is one of the changes so often you need to know who is acting precisely when but in contests and conflicts turn order become a, or you don't need to know who is acting precisely when but in contests and conflicts turn order can become important these scenes take over a series of exchanges and in exchange each involved character can take one overcome create an advantage or attack action and can move once because the defending is an action it doesn't really matter you can defend however many times you need to during other characters turns as long as you can justify it in the fiction um and then at the start of the scene the gm and players decide who goes first based on the situation and then the active player picks who goes next so which i think is great um, so basically the whole PC party generally, unless the piece, let's assume the PCs were not surprised 
they you generally allow the PC will go first. Um, so general, like PC number one will go and then they choose which next PC will go. That PC goes. And then generally once the PCs all end up going, um, it's then the NPC's turn, the GM's turn. Um, I think, you know, I, I really like that idea. It, it is less about, uh, you, there, there isn't an initiative role, which, um, does signify to the players, like you've entered into like this whole, this new kind of scene. Um, and it's always special and it's always fun in a DD or Pathfinder, or a game that uses an initial role to say literal initiative. It's a very big kind of moment at the table. Um, but I do really like turn order. One thing that I don't think is actually laid out here. Um, but one of the things that I really like that I've kind of ended up stealing from Star Trek Adventures and their momentum threat way is like I would probably as a GM if I saw an opportunity to really kind of like, you know, create something cool in the fiction and the story, what I would end up doing is potentially like offering to the players, Hey, I will spend one of my pooled fate points. Um, thereby, you know, there are going to be less invokes or stunts that my, like the GMs NPCs can use. I'm offering to spend one of my own fate points if I can jump in here and I can take over the initiative for my NPCs. And it's up to the players. That's something that I would kind of offer. I don't see that laid out in the rules, um, but it'd be a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm going to skip kind of most of the conflicts and challenges stuff. Obviously, like it, it is, it's good. Um, Oh, this is the best way to put it. Simply put, stress is plot armor. It's the resource used to keep your character up and in a fight. So it doesn't like, however your fiction makes sense, however you want to say it, like it just missed you or it hit you and you're kind of knocked down but not out kind of thing, then cool, like stress. But it's, I, I think it's great, especially in this fiction first kind of game that we are talking about. Conceding is huge um, and, and important to know about. Um, so we've got advancement. Um, at the end of each session, you'll earn a minor milestone, which lets you move things around on your character sheet. And then as you conclude each arc of the story, you'll earn a major milestone, which lets you add things to your character sheet. Um, basically, like you can swap ranks and skills or rewrite a stunt. Um, at the end of each session when you've hit a kind of minor milestone or rewrite an aspect even, uh, especially if the fiction changes and your character changes and you need to rewrite an aspect, you have the opportunity to do that at the end of every game session after earning a mile minus milestone, which I think is awesome. With major milestones, uh, you've spent the past five game sessions tracking down these cultists and you've finally beaten them. And while there's still this big trouble in your game setting that you're still tracking down. You've kind of accomplished like this kind of arc of story. You get to rewrite your high concept. If something huge has changed to you, you can add or rewrite your concept. Um, you can begin the recovery process for any uh, major severe consequences. And then you can increase the skill rating of one skill by one step, um, even if it's from mediocre to average, which is awesome. And then you, you can also, the GM can also allow the PCs to power up by offering, you can gain a point of refresh or you can increase a second skill, which is awesome. <coughs> I do really like the pyramid. You can't move uh, like in this instance, you could not level up one level one skill to a level two skill because you would then have more plus two skills than you have plus one. Like you still have to kind of achieve this pyramid column look. You got some GM stuff, which is, I mean, fairly basic for running beast GM, uh, running RPG games. 
making sure the key things for me is is uh, besides the rule stuff and blah 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 making sure everybody gets the spotlight and then complicating the pc's lives and building off of their player choices this is how you make a good game and that sh should be true for no matter what game you're running blah 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 it gives you some npc rules there is an entire just over a page which is great um but there's an entire toolkit called the fate adversary kit about uh, creating uh, adversary NPCs and it's important. So we've got our safety tools that talk about the X card and gives you the link for it, which is awesome. And then the script change RPG toolbox, which I actually have not looked at, um, which will, it provides options to pause, rewind, skip ahead or more using, um, I might have to look into that. That's really, really cool from Brie Bo Sheldon. Um, cool i might have to look at that um I, I am a fan of the x card but i do the, the script change toolbox does sound really really interesting so you got some ops uh some optional rules like conditions um versions of conditions character creation as you play which we've i kind of mentioned um extreme consequences Full defense. Sometimes a player or GM may want their character to go all in on using defend until their next turn rather than taking an action. This is called full defense. When declaring full defense, you must be clear about the focus of your efforts. By default, you're defending yourself from attacks and efforts to create advantages on you, but you may wish to specify someone you're protecting or defense against a particular group of aggressors. While on full defense, you get a plus two to all defend, defend roles relevant to your declared focus. That's cool. And then if nothing comes of it and you don't roll a defend at all, you gain a boost, which is cool. Like it, it's not a huge thing. Scale. Interesting. I've not seen this before. Optional subsystem that you can use to represent supernatural beings, which operate on a level beyond the general range capabilities of most characters in your game. Usually you don't need to worry about the impact of scale within your game. I would agree. Like if let's say you're playing a Dresden Files game, um, unless you are specifically creating a game about really, really, really low level mediocre magic users going up against big big things which i wouldn't recommend because it just like that you're you're setting your players up for a lot of failure unless you have a clear cut advancement for them like they have the ability to gain more power um normally scale is not going to come in so you may wish to change mundane represents characters without access supernatural who do have access otherworldly unusual or unique characters, legendary, and then godlike. When applying scale to two opposing forces or individuals, compare the size levels, and determines who is higher and by how many levels. They get one of the following benefits on any rolled action against the lesser. Plus one per level of difference before they roll, or plus two level of difference to the result after they roll if the roll succeeds, or a free invoke per level of difference. That would make sense. So, like, if, if again, running a, a Dresden Files campaign, if you're playing as a full-fledged wizard, but you're going up against one of the fairy queens, your fairy queen is a, you know, godlike being. That, I would say that is a three-level difference. And just because they're, you know, their character sheet would look, pretty similar, but even on, like there does have to be a level of scale. So I really like this. This is actually really cool. Obviously very specific to the kind of game that you're running, but really cool. Setting aspects are huge. Um, there, if you are looking for some more rules on how to create your setting with fate, fate core has great rules for creating a, a setting. Um, but yeah, uh, scenario aspects and setting aspects are, are big. Cool. 
reveal true form is amazing. Um, a solo bonus. That's cool. Where D and D the such a huge issue is like having to throw bigger and bigger things at your powerful party members. But a lot of times it's just one enemy against your party giving like a solo bonus is, is cool. Anything can be characters. Why not a map? When the threat is a map, your big bad has zones, which must be navigated to achieve director victory. Yeah, that's awesome. Weapon and armor ratings. This does introduce a bigger of uh, crunch to the game um, that I would hesitate to bring in um, unless you are really trying to show the power that your your person has. So like sticking with Dresden Files, if I was running a Dresden File game, everything would just be normal. A normal sword would not have a weapon value or armor value. But let's say, um, or honestly, like I would almost use it as an aspect instead. Um, like if my character is purposefully armored up before going into a situation, like they put on chain mail that they don't normally wear or bulletproof vest or something, I would almost rather give them a uh let them write in a situation like a a scenario aspect on themselves that they could then potentially tap they could invoke to for a defend role or something like that but excuse me but in trust files there's these magical swords that uh are wrought from the nails that hung jesus christ of nazareth on a certain cross um and i mean without getting into religion i myself am not religious uh they carry faith with them and so these swords have these nails embedded in them i would probably give the the knights uh or the the swords of the the holy cross i would probably give them a weapon rating just to show how powerful those things are but i would use it very very sparingly Ooh, i love this character sheet this is great i might actually steal this and convert it into a fillable pdf and where and that you can change the the skills because this would this would be great for anything but this is great i like this a lot more than the existing one but that's it that is uh that's that's fate condensed um uh yeah love it 10 out of 10 evil hat thank you so much for creating this product this is fantastic for hopefully new players coming to fate and for existing gms and players of fate i think this is absolutely fantastic um so if you would like to purchase this i will have links in the description to evil hats itch itch door and uh drive through rpg and i will update the description if a pod version ever becomes available um quick update i did a, a previous video on the base toolkit um that has like exited its beta and has art and it is getting printed which is awesome like not just pod it's actually getting printed and you could pre-order it or order it at your favorite local game store so if you enjoyed that video and maybe you had the pdf but you're like me and your favorite games you kind of want to collect hard copies the space toolkit is now available uh or is about to be available in print i think i saw Fred Hicks post on Twitter that it will be available like mid March. So be on the lookout for that. Um, anyway, hope you like and enjoyed this video. Um, if you would like more di deeper dives into fate or would like a video looking at fate accelerated or anything like that, let me know. I really, really, really enjoyed this system. Um, I do. I actually think if I'm going to start doing a little more videos, uh, I, I'm moving past Pathfinder and might start looking at Star Trek Adventures because I've started watching some actual plays and really enjoy how it 
seems how it looks at the table, but I have not really read the rule books yet, but I'm a Trekkie myself. Um, and while I am tempted to basically run everything that isn't D and D or Pathfinder, I'm tempted to just run any IP that I enjoy in fate, because why not? Um, things like the expanse star trek that star wars even that already has its own kind of system for like it's worth checking out maybe there's some ideas we can steal like momentum and threat i'm a big fan of in star trek adventures so if you like that let me know um again sorry for kind of being away but life gets in the way sometimes and i'm not you know doing this for i'm doing this for fun so i hope you had fun too uh again thanks to evil hat for creating this great product uh i hope you really enjoyed it if you did like it please buy it um i'm actually sh pretty sure this product is pay what you want on itch and probably even drive through um but please support incredible rpg products um this pdf is well worth a couple of bucks of your your hard-earned money even five bucks uh, goes a long way to showing uh, the company you will have that this is something the community wants. So um, anyway, thanks again for watching. Hope you enjoyed. We'll see you next time.